what I'll be speaking from today is a, uh, just a, uh, a manuscript that I've uh, recently put together called <coughs> Entrepreneurship and Economic Growth. Uh, and I uh, uh, start out considering the question of what causes economic growth. At the risk of oversimplification, uh, the answers that economists have given to this uh, question can be divided into two broad camps, one following the ideas of Adam Smith and the other following the ideas of David Ricardo. Smith's overriding goal was to try to understand the wealth creation process, uh, and the title of his treatise, The Wealth of Nations, uh, illustrates that. And the first lesson that we get in The Wealth of Nations is that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. As Adam Smith saw it, uh, as uh, markets grew, uh, entrepreneurship would lead to innovation that would lead to an increasing division of labor and increased productivity. Ricardo, in contrast, viewed output as being a function of inputs. Uh, he viewed that uh, the income of a nation was produced by the inputs of land, labor, and capital. Uh, he took a uh, production function approach to the question of economic growth. Investment uh, could produce more capital, which in turn could increase economic growth. But because of diminishing marginal factor productivity and the existence of fi fixed factors, uh, in particular land, uh, population growth uh, would always dominate economic growth and population, uh, most of the population would remain at a subsistence level of income. Uh, the ideas of Ricardo and his friend and contemporary uh, Malthus uh, uh, pushed this idea uh, on economics and ended up giving economics the name the dismal science. It sounds none too good the way Ricardo was describing it. Uh, but this contrasts sharply with uh, Adam Smith's uh, view of entrepreneurship and uh, innovation that would lead to ever increasing economic growth through an increased division of labor. Through hindsight, uh, we can see that Smith's vision of economic growth was more accurate than Ricardo's. But as it happens, the economics profession has re uh, followed Ricardo's views uh, more closely than Smith's. I think uh, a big part of that, especially if we look at 20th century uh, growth theory, has been the, the comparative statics nature of economic models. Uh, the, uh, because of the comparative, comparative statics nature of economic modeling, it's a lot easier to take the production function uh, view of economic output and economic growth, and it's a lot harder to uh, model things within that framework to model uh, innovation, the increased division of labor, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, so as economics has become more and more scientific over the 20th century, we've increasingly tried to uh, model the economic problems that we've been looking at within this uh, more mathematical, more scientific approach. Uh, and that's led us to focus more on the, uh, the aspects of the economy that we're better able to parameterize, that we can better fit into uh, general equilibrium models. And it's uh, been a little bit more difficult uh, to, uh, to take that approach uh, looking at the division of labor, entrepreneurship, and innovation, and so forth, because it doesn't really fit into that, uh, that production function approach and that general equilibrium approach uh, so well. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, you pr you've uh, probably heard the joke, in fact Roger tells me everybody's heard the joke, about the guy who's um, uh, uh, he's, he's in the night, you know, he's looking around on the sidewalk here, somebody comes along, you know, can I help you, what's going on? He says, yeah, he says, I've, I've uh, lost my ring. And he said, where'd you lose it? Uh, and the guy says, well, over there across the street. He says, well, why are you looking here? He says, well, the light's better over here. Um, and in a sense, that's the way that economic modeling of economic growth ha has taken place, that uh, we've got models that are amenable to looking at problems in particular ways. And so uh, we're... Uh, we're, sort of, we're looking at the for the answers to those problems where the light is better rather than uh, where it's actually uh, more likely that we'll end up finding the answer. If we take that production function approach uh, along Ricardian lines, uh, 
uh, <clears throat> with output being a function of land, labor, and capital, it really seems like the way to get economic growth uh, is through investment. And so uh, a lot of the advice that economists have given over the last uh, uh, half century uh, as to how to get economies to grow has been to invest. Uh, however, the Smithian approach to economic growth focuses more on innovation uh, than investment. And in considering these problems, uh, it occurred to me that Israel Kirzner's ideas of, of entrepreneurship fit in well with the Smithian idea of economic growth and the wealth of nations, and that it might be possible to, uh, to incorporate Kirzner's vision of entrepreneurship into uh, more standard uh, views of economic growth and perhaps uh, get some better answers. Uh, Kersner, in Kersner's view, uh, entrepreneurs act by seizing on previously unnoticed profit opportunities. Um, but uh, these profit opportunities have to come from somewhere. And as I'll discuss in more detail later on, I think the most common source of profit opportunities is the uh, prior activities of other entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship itself creates profit opportunities, which then opens up the opportunity for further uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, one distinction that I want to make, this was a, a, a distinction I made a little bit earlier in some comments, is the distinction between uh, looking at the process of economic growth versus the environment that produces economic growth, or the environment within which economic growth can occur. And I think there's good reason uh, for considering both, uh, but what I intend to look at more today is uh, the process of economic growth rather than, than the environment uh, within which uh, economic growth occurs. In fact, I guess there, uh, if we divide up an examination of economic growth that way, we've got a pretty good balance here on the panel because I think uh, the Betkin and Olson papers more were involved with the environment with, in which economic growth can occur, uh, whereas uh, Garrison's paper and my paper deal more with the process by which economic growth is produced. I think it's worthwhile to look at the environment, uh, and in fact there's been uh, a lot of interest uh, lately at looking at the environment. Uh, Jerry Scully has uh, a couple of things. He had an article in the JPE a few years ago and has recently come out with, an e uh, with a book uh, essentially advocating uh, market institutions and, and suggesting that economic freedom uh, leads to additional economic growth. Um, uh, Barrow has done a little bit of work along those lines. Of course, uh, your work. Uh, and I'll also uh, uh, advertise again the book that uh, Pete Betke mentioned uh, by my colleague Jim Gortney, along with Bob Lawson and Walter Block, uh, this year put out a book uh, on measuring economic freedom. Uh, and they uh, have uh, drawn up, they've gone through a lot of care to draw up indexes of economic freedom and shown how uh, a higher index of economic freedom uh, leads to more economic growth. Uh, and I might say one of the things that they did that I think has not been done in this literature so much in the past is they've got a pretty comprehensive index of economic freedom. They look at a lot of, of the components of economic freedom, stable monetary policy, freedom of exchange, protection of property rights. Um, another interesting variable that they I include in economic freedom is that might be worth some discussion later on uh, is the size of government. They find that smaller uh, smaller governments lead, uh, they call that more economic freedom and uh, show that that's correlated with economic growth. Uh, and the interesting thing about their work is that they really focus on economic variables. There's been uh, a lot of empirical work, the Barrow's work that I've seen has drawn on this index uh, that's been put out by Gasteel. Uh, Scully's work uses that same index and that index has a lot of, of political type uh, freedoms, how democratic a country is, you know, if you have the right to vote and, and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, uh, Gortney and his colleagues uh, explicitly leave out any of those political variables to look specifically just at uh, economic freedom. So 
while I see some good reason for looking at the institutional characteristics that lead to economic growth, nevertheless, most of what I'm going to focus on uh, is going to be with the process of economic growth. Contemporary growth theory uh, perhaps uh, starts with the solo model, or at least uh, most economists who are familiar with growth theory will, uh, will be able to trace it back at least to the, to the solo model, uh, where, again, using that Ricardian production function uh, approach, uh, we find that growth is a function or output is a function of capital and labor and in some way uh, time. So we've got some solo residual. Presumably the uh, time itself doesn't cause economic growth, but there's something that's uh, correlated uh, with time that, that leads to uh, higher levels of output over time. Uh, and there's, uh, there's been a lot of interesting uh, results out of this uh, uh, literature. Uh, the, uh, the idea of some golden rule of growth uh, was popular at one time. The idea of convergence where growth rates across countries ought to uh, converge uh, is an interesting idea and in fact has led to uh, further developments in growth theory because as a matter of fact when we look at growth rates across countries we find out that they don't converge, that some countries seem to have persistently low growth rates, other countries seem to have persistently higher growth rates and so that's opened up the question of looking at uh, why it is that convergence doesn't occur. Um, when we consider something like the solo model, and we look at the relationships among output, capital, and labor, uh, it, it's relatively easy to, to model those things. And despite some measurement difficulties, it's relatively easy to um, measure capital and labor and output so we can estimate production functions and so forth. Uh, and the effect of time in the solar model is a little bit more problematic. It's been associated with technological change. We think that in some way or another probably technology advances over time. And so uh, <clears throat> that's how time ends up having its impact. But nevertheless, that's, that's pretty nebulous and it's hard to measure. Uh, and it's easier to measure capital and labor, so as a result, I guess that's where the light is better. We focused in on, on capital and labor as a result. Uh, and, you know, lest we think that we've just done that for, for simplicity because these things are easier to measure or that we're using it as some sort of a framework for economic growth or something like that, uh, these uh, Ricardian-type growth models have been taken pretty seriously uh, by economists and policymakers, and they've been considered to be pretty policy relevant, so that in the decades after World War II, uh, when economists have, have offered policy advice as to uh, what we can do to get less developed economies to grow, uh, looking at something along the lines of the solo model, we've advised them to invest. And, you know, if, if we can uh, uh, get more capital in the economy, increase the capital labor ratio, that would help. Uh, other economies around the world have uh, developed economies have developed through industrialization, so that seemed like a good plan. We have advised less developed economies to industrialize, invest in, uh, in, in uh, industries and pri try to bring them along uh, to become competitive on the world market. But the advice turned out not to be very good advice, and despite the fact that um, of uh, following the investment advice of the World Bank and a bunch of consulting economists and so forth that, uh, that investment was the key. Uh, a lot of money has gone into less developed economies and uh, in, in many cases they've remained underdeveloped um, even though uh, it, it would appear that investment would be the key in the solo model. Uh, and so uh, that, that leads to uh, looking in, uh, in other areas to try to figure out, well, okay, maybe if investment isn't the key, maybe there's uh, uh, other things that we might be able to do. And uh, again, looking at this, the nebulous effect of time, uh, if we think the technology might have been the answer, uh, that technology is what advances over time, then maybe what we can do is uh, increase the, the uh, level of technology available. Maybe uh, increased research and development might make uh, economies more uh, productive over time. Uh, 
Uh, or again, looking within the Ricardian framework, uh, if uh, in part you would expect R&D in developed countries to spill over to less developed countries, maybe that's not the answer either. Um, and uh, economists have recently noticed uh, the, that somewhat neglected variable there, if we think that output is a function of capital and labor and somehow uh, output advances over time. Uh, wow, we forgot to notice labor. Uh, so maybe labor really is the key and not, uh, and not capital. Uh, but it hasn't been so much uh, labor like the number of bodies itself that economists have focused on recently, but rather human capital. Uh, and it may turn out that uh, it's uh, human capital that leads to uh, uh, economic growth. Uh, and uh, Lucas has been one of the pioneers here in uh, his uh, paper in 1988 talking about uh, the forces that lead to economic growth uh, was uh, one of the early mainstream economists to suggest that uh, that maybe labor uh, is the key and specifically human capital and so if we invest in human capital and education uh, that that's a, a good thing to do. Uh, and I have to say I really like that argument myself because working in a state university um, uh, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, if we put, invest more in education, that's probably going to spill over into the well-being of college faculty and so forth. So I don't know if it'll really help growth or not, but, but I'll push the argument just for my own, uh, my own self-interest. Uh, in contrast to this Ricardian view, uh, the, uh, the Smithian view of economic growth uh, has focused less on the quantities of factors of production going into the production process and more on the process itself. I mean, uh, e even from the beginning of Smith's Wealth of Nations when he has that nice example of the pin factory and he talks about how much more uh, productive uh, people are due to the division of labor. What he's really thinking of is not inputs into the production process. I mean, you've got the same raw materials, the same people making pins. So Smith isn't talking about inputs into a production process. He's talking about the process itself and how we might be able to alter and develop the production process in order to make us more productive with the same inputs. And uh, this idea uh, has been noticed uh, occasionally throughout the 20th century. There's a nice paper by Alan Young in 1928 uh, on uh, increasing returns in economic progress. And Young explicitly uh, builds uh, his ideas on Adam Smith and develops the idea that there may be increasing returns and it's increasing returns that leads to economic growth and economic progress. That's uh, uh, a, a very Smithian way of looking at the idea of economic growth. Uh, however, increasing returns doesn't really work that well all the time in a general equilibrium model. So uh, at the same time, if you've got these general equilibrium uh, models of growth, you're trying to build on the, on the solo model, which essentially is an equilibrium model, uh, increasing returns might not fit in so well. Uh, and there is a... An article I remember reading in, in uh, graduate school, which I was fascinated at, uh, about at the time, by Nicholas Calder in uh, 1972 called The Irrelevance of Equilibrium Economics. And Calder's article uh, built upon uh, Alan Young's article, which in turn goes back to Adam Smith. Uh, but Calder was arguing that, in fact, increasing returns really is the answer to economic growth, but that doesn't really fit in too well with the general equilibrium framework that uh, most economists are using. So Calder's answer to this was just to throw out general equilibrium analysis altogether. Uh, actually, uh, some of these uh, uh, general equilibrium economists have gotten a, a little bit better at building in some of these ideas of increasing returns. And it may well be, it's, it's problematic if you have increasing returns in particular industries uh, because then uh, you end up getting all kinds of corner solutions and indeterminacies and that sort of thing. And, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you know, we, we really like uh, determinant interior solutions to our models, right? So. About two weeks ago, I got, got a little ill, and I still have this residual cough. So if I break into a hacking cough in the middle of my talk, it's... Um, uh, but lately, uh, 
economists looking at the idea of economic growth have gotten more into the idea of, of increasing returns. And especially, it can be modeled pretty well if uh, instead of having particular industries having increasing returns, if the increasing returns are economy-wide, even though there are decreasing returns in particular industries. And that occurs by having spillovers. So you might have some kind of of uh, technology spillovers or information spillovers or knowledge spillovers. Uh, and Paul Romer has uh, put together a few models that show how this can work. So in, in each individual sector, you have decreasing returns to scale. And yet, because of these uh, spillovers across sectors of the economy, uh, you end up having increasing returns. Uh, Romer also focuses on the role of, of uh, human capital. So human capital has become, uh, has really replaced physical capital as I think the, the darling of, of mainstream growth theory these days anyway. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Romer shows how additional research, uh, research and development activity can uh, promote more economic growth because there might be increasing returns to R&D. Uh, and it also could be that uh, th that these returns might be localized, so there might be more localized spillovers, so you can have geographic concentrations of areas where because of uh, spillovers there ends up being higher growth rates, other areas have lower growth rates. So we can uh, sort of massage the, the Ricardian approach to economic growth in order to fit some of the facts like uh, non-convergence. And so uh, contemporary models, even though uh, these models, I, I think, fit into what I would consider the Ricardian growth framework, nevertheless fit the empirical facts a little bit better. If we, if we look at the facts of economic growth, uh, I think they have to weigh against the idea of inputs into the production process causing economic growth. Of course, this occurred to Ricardo right away because of the problem of de decreasing returns. But uh, over the history of the world, there have been lots of economies that seem to have, have had the inputs in place that would have led to economic growth, and yet where economic growth hasn't occurred. Uh, I think earlier we had uh, mentioned the idea of China that had a lot of physical capital, a lot of human capital, they were technologically advanced, and yet uh, the, the economy didn't take off and didn't grow. Uh, the, pyramid, the pyramids in Egypt still remain as a monument to the uh, uh, physical capital that they had there, but I'm not sure it was really directed into the uh, sectors that might have caused the most economic growth. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, 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 knowledge has been uh, developing over this, the uh, uh, the centuries, uh, you, you've got to be inspired by guys like Leonardo da Vinci, yet for, uh, for all of his genius and, and the knowledge that he had, it really didn't lead to economic growth, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, in fact, if you extrapolate backwards, um, uh, today real GNP is about uh, 37 times as large as it was in 1874. It's about seven times larger than in, in 1919. It's more than three times larger than in 1950. If we extrapolate backwards, extrapolate this growth backwards, we can see we don't have to go back uh, very far, a, a couple of centuries perhaps, before we get to a point where we would be at the subsistence level. The economic growth that we have today could not have occurred uh, uh, for, uh, over a very long period of time. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that the inputs to the production process, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, were in place. Again, China seems like a good example. Uh, so it's, it's probably not the inputs into the production process, but rather changes in the process itself. Not, it's the Smithian view of growth rather than, than the Ricardian view of growth that really explains why we have economic growth. And the Austrian, uh, uh, the Austrians seem to fit well into that Smithian uh, tradition. Uh, Bamba Werk uh, depicted a structure of production that was picked up by Hayek and later by Garrison. Uh, and incorporated into into economic models, where uh, we look at the at the structure of production, we look at at more roundabout production processes. What we're really focusing in on there is the process by which uh, economic output is produced, as opposed to the inputs into the production process per se. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this idea remains 
uh, current in the Austrian theory. In fact, I think uh, that uh, Roger's presentation this morning is a good example about how uh, we can get some pretty interesting results by looking at the process of production as opposed to focusing on the inputs into the production process. If we consider uh, the role of entrepreneurship and technological change, uh, in, in the neoclassical framework, even if we consider the more recent uh, uh, growth models like those of Lucas and those of Romer, uh, where uh, uh, there is some focus on the process and technological change and research and development are important, still it seems to me that those models go back to the Ricardian framework. In other words, if, if we think the technological advance is good and we can produce technology through R&D, then what we do is we combine resources into the production process and we produce research and development in those models the same way we produce other output. So we're really not focusing on the process of production at all, but rather we're looking at inputs into the production process, but instead of focusing so much on physical capital like we did in the 1950s and 60s, now we're focusing on human capital or knowledge or research and development or something like that. So what's the alternative? Well, one alternative is Kersner's uh, model of entrepreneurship. Uh, Kersner uh, views that entrepreneurs are people who are alert enough to spot previously unseen profit opportunities and then act on them. Uh, so in Kersner's view, the activity of entrepreneurship is noticing something that nobody's noticed before. Uh, and I think uh, Kersner's ideas build on, on Hayek's ideas, uh, and especially in his uh, 1945 article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, uh, where everybody has uh, some specific knowledge of time and place, knowledge that's specific to their activities and what they're doing that other people don't have. And if given the proper incentives, people then can act on this, this, these, uh, the specific information of time and place that they have, uh, in order to be entrepreneurial. How does it happen that people can spot entrepreneurial opportunities that nobody's seen before? Economic theory really biases us uh, against thinking that this is possible because in the, the neoclassical competitive equilibrium, all of the profit opportunities have been competed away. Uh, in fact, if we, uh, if we think about that joke, uh, Roger told me not to tell any jokes, but uh, if we think about the joke that uh, forms the title of your, your paper, Mansur, about finding the, the, the big bills on the sidewalk, does everybody know that joke? Yeah, right. <laughs> if we think about that joke, you know, I mean, the reason why it's funny to economists, and I've found in telling the joke it's not funny to anybody but economists, <laughs> but... Um, but the reason why it's funny to economists is, is it shows you, in a sense, how ridiculous the, e the equilibrium theory that we advocate is. You know, uh, you know, but, but where do these profit opportunities come from? Uh, and uh, I don't think that Kersner really gives a very good answer to this question. Actually, he's not that, that interested in answering the question. In his book, Comp Competition and Entrepreneurship, he really focuses on entrepreneurship as an equilibrating mechanism and shows how the activities of entrepreneurs can help bring an economy into equilibrium, so he's not so much interested in where the profit opportunities come from uh, or, or how they get noticed, but the fact that entrepreneurial activity is an equilibrating uh, function. But let me give you my answer uh, to that question. I think that uh, most profit opportunities get noticed by entrepreneurs because they're new. They spring up, they're new, something that, that wasn't there before, people tend to notice it, and entrepreneurs tend to act on those profit opportunities, uh, uh, and, and that's what initiates the, uh, uh, the Kersnerian entrepreneurial process. Uh, perhaps you have to have some special insight to really see what those profit opportunities are. Uh, in hindsight, they're perhaps easier to see than in foresight, but nevertheless, if we consider uh, famous entrepreneurs and see the way that they've acted, 
uh, Andrew Carnegie, who built his fortune in, in U.S. steel, uh, was quick to notice that the uh, Bessemer process was a more productive way of producing steel and capitalized on that new process. It's not like it was sitting around for centuries and all of a sudden Carnegie notices it. It's a newly developed uh, process that Carnegie is able to capitalize on. Henry Ford, who is entrepreneurial in developing the assembly line and producing automobiles through assembly lines, uh, w could only do that when there was a mass market for automobiles. In order for there to be a mass market for automobiles, there had to be the service stations, the roads. In other words, there had to be other automobiles around. Uh, so it wouldn't really have been feasible to have assembly line production of automobiles before the the environment was was the way it was in Ford's time. So Henry Ford, uh, sensing a profit opportunity and acting on it, this wasn't something that had gone unnoticed for centuries. Things had changed. The environment had changed. The profit opportunity was a relatively recent opportunity. Bill Gates, who became a multi-billionaire producing uh, uh, microcomputer software, uh, was able to do that because microcomputers uh, suddenly became possible. It's not like microcomputers were sitting around for centuries with no decent operating system and all of a sudden it occurs to Gates. Uh, I mean, he was one of the first people there on the scene uh, uh, to see that, that profit opportunity. So it's not like there, I mean, it's not like these $20 bills are lying around on the sidewalk for us to notice, but as soon as they're dropped, people pick them up pretty quickly. The profit opportunities are, are, are noticed because they're new. There's something that wasn't there before that people hadn't seen before because they weren't there before. Another good example is, uh, is Ray Kroc and McDonald's. Uh, you know, who had the good idea of, uh, hey, we can make the food before the customers show up, and then we can give it to them really quickly. Uh, and uh, the uh, original McDonald's uh, uh, sold almost entirely to drive-in customers, but there was a particular kind of market that had to exist at that time. When America became uh, more mobile, more people are traveling by automobile, they can stop in and pick up their... Uh, their hamburgers and so forth, the opportunity is ripe. And in fact, it wasn't even Ray Kroc that, that started McDonald's. McDonald's was a, a going concern at the time. Uh, and Ray Kroc was a guy who was uh, selling um, uh, like blenders, milkshake makers. And uh, uh, this McDonald's restaurant ordered a whole bunch of these things. And, and Ray Kroc is, cu is curious. He's just, you know, he's going to fill this order. But he thought, I'm going to go out and look at this restaurant because I want to see what kind of a restaurant is ordering so many of these things. <laughs> and so he looked at the restaurant and actually saw an opportunity that perhaps the McDonald's who started the restaurant didn't see. He just bought up the chain and, and uh, was very entrepreneurial about it. But that's an opportunity that, that was a relatively recent opportunity. It's not that opportunity wasn't sitting around for centuries or even decades. The, the market environment had changed and really as soon as that opportunity uh, was available for the picking, uh, uh, Ray Kroc took advantage of it. <clears throat> a lot of these entrepreneurial activities <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, entrepreneurial ap activities arise because of the activities of other entrepreneurs. Uh, we see that uh, that uh, Bill Gates uh, made uh, a pretty good fortune in producing microcomputer software, uh, but that's only because some entrepreneurs had a good idea to produce microcomputers. And you remember the the. Uh, the story of Apple Computer, uh, and these, you know, Steve Jobs trying to sell this idea of computers to established companies, and they thought, well, oh, this is ridiculous. Nobody's going to want little computers like this. So they started up Apple Computer uh, uh, by themselves, an entrepreneurial uh, insight again. And, and, and if they hadn't been entrepreneurial, Gates wouldn't have had his opportunity. Uh, but we can take that a step further back. You couldn't have made these personal computers without microprocessors. The microprocessor wasn't very old before companies started making microcomputers. So one entrepreneurial insight, one innovation leads to another. One bit of entrepreneurial activity creates more entrepreneurial act opportunities for other people. So where do these entrepreneurial uh, Activi uh, opportunities come from? They come from the activities of other entrepreneurs. Uh, entrepreneurs. One of the big ideas these days in, uh, in uh, standard growth models is increasing returns. Economists are trying to build in increasing returns uh, through things like 
uh, uh, knowledge externalities. That's a, a big idea where people develop knowledge and then there's not, there are knowledge spillovers into other industries and these knowledge uh, externalities end up creating uh, increasing returns for the economy uh, as a whole. Uh, so it's not individual firms or individual, uh, well, it's not individual firms that have increasing returns, but rather the economy as a whole. Uh, and that's a very uh, Smithian kind of idea. Uh, you know, Smith argued that the division of labor was limited by the extent of the market. Uh, so as we have additional firms, we have economic growth, that leads the market to grow, which leads us to have the opportunity to have increased uh, specialization which opens up additional entrepreneurial activities. That idea is, is pretty clear in the, uh, uh, for example, Romer's uh, models of economic growth. Uh, but uh, but the, the the idea of knowledge externalities is there without without really discussing the process by which uh, by which these uh, knowledge externalities get produced, uh, and so it's it's worth asking the question: What conditions have to exist in order for these knowledge externalities to be uh, to be produced? Uh, and we've discussed the role of market institutions uh, in creating a fertile environment for uh, knowledge externalities. Uh, so, so if we ask ourselves the question, what's the process that generates these positive externalities that lead to economic growth? Uh, I think the Kersnerian theory of entrepreneurship fits in pretty well, and we can point to Kersnerian entrepreneurship as the process that leads to these knowledge externalities that produces economic growth. If essentially, when, you, when economic growth is viewed this way, it becomes endogenous because entrepreneurial activity creates economic growth, which generates additional entrepreneurial opportunities, which leads to more economic opportunity, uh, entrepreneurial activities, which creates more economic growth. Uh, if you have a very static economy, if you have something like a traditional economy, I think one reason why the uh, the uh, Chinese economy uh, was uh, stagnant, didn't exhibit uh, economic growth, as it was organized along more traditional uh, uh, lines uh, and was in fact a relatively static economy. And when things don't change very much from year to year, from generation to generation, obviously there's not going to be very much uh, in the way of economic uh, opportunities or entrepreneurial opportunities. It's the same thing as if we look at the economy in a general equilibrium model. In a general equilibrium model, there aren't any entrepreneurial activities because all of the profit opportunities have already been competed away. So there's really no room for Kersnerian entrepreneurship in a general equilibrium. Now, if they general equilibrium is disturbed for some reason or another, then profit opportunities arise, then entrepreneurial activity uh, uh, can, uh, can start up. Looked at in this way, you see the engine of economic growth, the engine of innovation in an economy is entrepreneurship. And that's different from the uh, more uh, standard neoclassical models that point to things like investment in human capital uh, and research and development. Uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, when, when you... Uh, you consider, I mean, you might think, well, isn't that really the same thing, though, that, that uh, entrepreneurship leads to innovation and uh, which creates uh, the incentive to gain additional knowledge and so forth. But if you consider it within the Ricardian framework, a production function approach, uh, and you think that the answer really is research and development, technological change, human capital, uh, 
this isn't something that we've just figured out today. In fact, it was well known in centrally planned economies decades ago. And isn't that exactly the strategy that the Soviet Union tried to follow? I mean, they were pretty heavy into research and development. They invested in human capital. They invested in physical capital. And yet, they didn't have economic growth. And the reason why, I would assert, is there, there weren't any entrepreneurial act, uh, opportunities. See? So, so what I'm trying to do here is to draw a contrast between the Kersnerian view of entrepreneurship and the, and the more Ricardian view of research and development as something that can be produced. You know, you have inputs into a production function where you can produce research and development and end up getting uh, additional uh, economic activity. If we take the Kersnerian framework and look at economic growth in the Kersnerian framework, research and development isn't the cause of economic growth, it's the effect. The reason why people engage in research and development is because they see that they're profit opportunities. Right? And so they engage in research and development to try to capitalize on those profit opportunities. So re research and development is the effect of economic growth, the effect of entrepreneurial activities, rather than the cause of economic growth. Uh, and again, to see the contrast, consider uh, an economy like the former Soviet Union, where they, they invested in research and development. They invested in human and physical capital, and yet they didn't have economic growth. Uh, so where does this entrepreneurship come from? It comes from past entrepreneurship, as I've, as I've suggested before. Uh, we don't have a static setting in the economy in this case. We have a dynamic setting where every entrepreneurial uh, opportunity uh, opens up additional uh, entrepreneurial activities for, uh, for new entrepreneurs. There are are several different factors that might lead to, uh, to, to economic growth uh, once we take ourselves out of an equilibrium setting. Um, one, one is that when an equilibrium is upset, that creates profit opportunities because we're in a disequilibrium uh, situation, which can lead to additional entrepreneurial uh, activity. Uh, a second factor that can lead to entrepreneurship and, and economic growth is increases in income itself. If income is growing, then if we go back to Adam Smith's dictum that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, a gr uh, growing income leads to a bigger market, and as the extent of the market increases, we can end up having a finer division of labor, and, uh, and we can have uh, increased income as a result. Uh, a third factor, and I think this is really the most important factor, is that entrepreneurial insights create new markets and, as a result, provide new opportunities for entrepreneurship that go along with that innovation. And, and this is really the key to, uh, to uh, uh, economic growth if we, imp if, if we take it from a Kersnerian foundation. Uh, you know, if we consider, for example, uh, an innovation like, have you all tried an infrared mouse for your computer? You, can use an infrared, you don't have to have the cord, you just use an infrared um, uh, mouse. And that's a, a, an entrepreneurial insight. Uh, and again, like the examples I gave before, the only way that you could really have that insight of the infrared mouse uh, is if you, somebody came up with the idea of using a mouse to begin with, with the personal computer, and the only way somebody could have that insight is if somebody had developed the personal computer to begin with. Again, the, these entrepreneurial opportunities aren't just laying around uh, waiting for people to discover them. Uh, in fact, pretty rapidly after the opportunities arise, Entrepreneurs spot them and they act on them. And if we consider this example of the infrared mouse as, a, as an innovation and, and think about where it came from and consider the three factors that I'd concern, uh, considered before, it wasn't that entrepreneurship occurred because there was a disequilibrium situation. It's not that the market was disequilibrated that created the opportunity for the infrared mouse. It's, it's that the new good, the personal computer, uh, uh, was available. So disequilibrium isn't the explanation. Also, rising incomes, that's not the explanation. Rising incomes, which increases the extent of the market. In fact, it's Kersnerian entrepreneurship, the fact that somebody had the idea to begin with, that you could work your computer with a mouse, that's a better way to do it. It's this Kersnerian insight, 
this innovation that leads to the opportunity for the next innovation. So we end up having uh, entrepreneurial activity that's the result of past entrepreneurial activity. If we consider uh, using Kersner's model of entrepreneurship as a foundation for economic growth, uh, I think there are a couple of advantages to this. First of all, I think it adds some insight into Kersner's model of entrepreneurship. And second of all, I think it helps us to understand the process of economic growth a little better. Uh, in Kersner's model of entrepreneurship, he talks about these profit opportunities, these previously unnoticed profit opportunities, but he doesn't really discuss where they come from. And again, I, I think that's because he's more interested in the equilibrating effects of entrepreneurial activity. And so his idea is, here's a profit opportunity that exists. Let's see how entrepreneurship leads toward market equilibrium. Uh, but if we consider... Kersnerian entrepreneurship within the context of economic growth, then we endogenize uh, the origin of these profit opportunities. You know, where do these profit opportunities come from to begin with? Well, they come from the past entrepreneurial activities of other individuals. Uh, you, you can see at the same time that we get some insight uh, uh, into, into where the entrepreneurial activities might arise. We see that, for example, if we have relatively stagnant economies, we have economies that, that aren't growing and aren't developing, there's not going to be very many entrepreneurial uh, opportunities, so we're not going to have very much Kersnerian entrepreneurship. Uh, on the other hand, in growing economies, uh, here's where the increasing returns uh, comes, to, comes to play. When you have growing economies, more entrepreneurial ac uh, opportunities are created, which leads to more entrepreneurship, which leads to more economic growth. So, uh, I instead of just taking these entrepreneurial opportunities as, as given or just uh, available to entrepreneurs, now, by putting this in a growth framework, we can see where the entrepreneurial uh, uh, insights actually come from. They come from past entrepreneurship. At the same time, uh, the uh, uh, putting uh, Kersnerian entrepreneurship in as the engine of economic growth helps to give us some insight into growth theory uh, because it, it, uh, it shows us how innovation takes place in the economy. It focuses more on the Smithian idea of economic growth. It focuses in on the idea that it's not more or better inputs that lead to economic growth, but rather it's a better environment for entrepreneurs. Uh, and this really leads back to the ideas of considering the environment of economic uh, growth. We think about market institutions, stable money, protection of property rights, and so forth. And all of those are, are environmental factors that that lead toward uh, returns to entrepreneurs. And so as a result, if we have a setting that's conducive to entrepreneurship, we're likely to get more economic growth. Uh, and, and again, this, this uh, contrasts uh, with the neoclassical idea that I think has, um, has kept up through the Lucas models and the Romer models and so forth of economic growth, where it's the inputs into the production process. Now, human capital and R&D are fashionable uh, rather than physical capital. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we really don't see the process by which human capital or additional research and development lead to economic growth. And the problem with that is that from a policy standpoint, we run into the same problems that we ran into back when we thought that physical capital was the answer. So that now the advice that we're, that we're uh, giving countries, instead of invest in these infant industries and try to get them to grow so that you end up getting... Uh, uh, inefficient industries and developing economies that continue to drag the economy down because they continually have to subsidize the economy. Now, instead, we say, well, invest in human capital. That's the answer. You know, if you invest in human capital, uh, but what ends up happening a lot of times, you invest, the, the economies invest in human capital, but there's no real good way to apply human capital. There's no entrepreneurial uh, opportunities, and a lot of times, the human capital that less developed economies invest in goes overseas uh, to economies where there are more entrepreneurial act uh, opportunities. So 
by using uh, Kersner's entrepreneurship as a foundation for growth theory, we see that it's not the inputs into the production process that are the key, it's the process itself and it's innovation and entrepreneurship that leads to economic growth. So we need to create an environment that's conducive to economic growth. And then we see that investment in physical capital, research and development activities, investment in human capital, those are the results of economic growth. We don't need to tell people to invest in research and development or human capital, if entrepreneurial activities uh, opportunities are there and it's profitable to do so, then there's the market incentive for that type of investment to take place. So that's really not good policy advice to begin with. The policy advice is create institutions that are amenable to entrepreneurship and economic growth. And at the same time, you know, if, if we take the Ricardian models of economic growth, it still leads to bad policy advice as far as you know, ad advising the investment in human capital, physical capital, research and, devel and development and so forth, focusing on the inputs into the production process rather than the development of the process itself. Uh, since the days of Ricardo, when we focused on the inputs in the production process, first of all, we get pretty pessimistic results. We end up producing the dismal science that shows us how we can never have economic advancement. Yet for two centuries, since Adam Smith's insights, we have. And the reason why is, as Smith told us, the important thing is the process itself, the institutional environment that creates an environment that, that is conducive to economic growth. It's the process, not the inputs into the process.